What's up everybody? Welcome back to yet another Obscure Atlas Games video. Y'all probably know the drill by now, but there are a lot of criminally underrated games under Atlas's belt. I've already done three videos on this topic alone, but because there are so many and only so many I can cover in a single video, we're doing a fourth one. So without further ado, let's get into some more underrated Atlas games. But first, I want to give a shout out to this video's sponsor, Shadow Fate. Shadow Fate is a new JRPG packed full of action, adventure, and heartfelt emotion. It follows Spawn, a supernatural being whose body is made entirely of human sin. It should make him look like a terrifyingly cold-blooded killer, but he strangely forms a powerful bond with the insecure young Wyatt, one of his assassination targets given to him by the Sinister Vengeance Guild. Spawn's dark destiny is put in further doubt as he starts making more and more connections to other troubled characters. From haunting failure to crushing inadequacy, or just the desire to live more authentically, this is a tale of identity and longing, spanning a huge world from urban metropolis to arctic tower, seaside port to the desert dunes, and everything in between. The combat in Shadow Fate is familiar, yet innovative. Turn-based battles are given adrenaline-pulsing flair with amazing action sequences and an X-meter system borrowed from fighting games like Mortal Kombat. It allows you to turn a regular AoE skill into a full on-screen assault, or you can turn it into a show-stopping super if you wait a little longer. Don't miss this landmark title in the genre, available now on Steam and currently 33% off for a limited time. I'll have a link down below in the description. Go check it out. I'm going to kick things off with what is probably the most requested game commenters have suggested I cover. Stella Glow for the 3DS, developed by Image Epoch and released in 2015. And this would actually be the last game that they ever released, about a month after going defunct, and then it was later translated and released in North America by Atlas in November of that same year. Now, if the name Image Epoch sounds familiar, that may be because they co-developed Fate Extra, which is a game I covered in a previous video, and also Luminous Arc 1-3, through 3, the first two of which were translated by Atlas and actually have a lot in common. In fact, this is kind of a spiritual successor. Now, in Stella Glow, you take on the role of Reen Schwartz, Oh wait, that's not Reen Schwarzer? Oh, sorry. Alto, who is an orphan who lost his memory, who got adopted by a woman named Rosa, and lives in a small village with her and her daughter, Lizette. The backstory is that long ago, God tried to punish humanity because their faith in him was weakening, which led to God taking away their ability to sing, so a hero named Elcrest went up into heaven and gave his life to save the human race. One day, when exploring, Alto hears a witch singing, who the next day shows up and destroys the town and turns everyone in it into crystal statues. He causes Lizette to awaken to some magical powers and become a witch herself, and then he's recruited by the kingdom's military, and he and a few other knights embark on their quest to find four other elemental witches so that they can free the villages from crystallization. The gameplay is divided into two sections. The combat, which is an isometric strategy RPG, and the free time, where you can do various jobs, explore for items, or spend time with your fellow party members who can teach them new skills and improve their performance in battle. The combat, like I said, is an isometric SRPG, and it's pretty much what you'd expect. There's really not a lot to say. You've got your different characters with different stats and abilities, you can customize their equipment, and pretty much the goal of every mission is to defeat all enemies. It's standard stuff and really not all that revolutionary, but it is still fun. The only thing that's kind of unique is the concept of tuning, which is when you go into a witch's heart to remove her negative emotions, and sometimes this is actually necessary to improve your bond with them. There's also this meter you have that goes up as you deal or take damage, and once it gets full enough, you can use it to unleash some powerful song magic, which only witches have access to. I'll be perfectly honest, this wasn't actually my first time playing this game. I thought about including it in a previous video, but I played a tiny bit of it and I wasn't liking it at first, mainly because the cutscenes I feel are unnecessarily long, and the combat overall just feels very slow paced, and there isn't much you can do to speed it up either. In the footage you're watching right now, I actually have battle animations disabled, and even then it still feels slow. Another thing I'm also not a fan of is the graphics. For some reason, it was common for SRPGs of this generation to use this chibi art style, likely due to hardware limitations, and yeah, I just don't like it. However, I cannot tell you how much I regret sleeping on this game because, turns out, Stella Glow is pretty freaking good. While the gameplay is pretty basic, Stella Glow more than makes up for this with its presentation. For one thing, it takes on this colorful abstract oil painting art style that looks like something you'd see in a storybook, and it's really fitting for the theme of the game. And the music is absolutely beautiful. 
Not only does it have your adrenaline pumping JRPG soundtracks, and I don't think I need to explain that the opening is a banger, but honestly the soundtracks that I enjoyed the most were some of the more traditional orchestral ones. I don't know what it is about it, but this is some of the best orchestral music I've heard in any JRPG, especially on the 3DS. I could listen to this all day. The voice acting is also really good, and if you played any of Atlas's other games, especially Persona 4 and 5, you'll probably recognize a lot of the voice actors here. The story isn't anything all that special, but the game's world and characters are interesting enough to keep you wanting to play, and the plot does pick up more the further in you get. Plus, it does have multiple endings, and you can also get a different epilogue depending on who you have the highest affinity with. Another thing is, this is just a really long game. It'll take you well over 40 hours to beat your first time around. You're definitely getting your money's worth if you buy this game, that much is certain. Stella Glow is a game that isn't going to keep you glued to your screen for its gameplay, but the story and characters do enough to make up for this, and that goes double for the art and music. I would say that I think this game could use a re-release on PC, because having added features to speed up the combat would help this game a lot, but considering that the developer went belly up before this game even released, I don't see that happening. In fact, when does the 3DS eShop close again? Oh yeah, if you're interested in buying this game, you better get on that while you can. Okay, so this next one is another one that's been on my mind for a while, and I actually did play it some time ago and had planned to make a video on it at one point, but I never got around to that, so I'm just going to cover it here instead. This is Stella Deus, The Gate of Eternity, developed by Atlas and released in 2004 in Japan, and 2005 in North America. And I should also mention that, despite the fact that this and Stella Glow are both published by Atlas, are strategy RPGs, and have Stella in the name, they actually have nothing to do with each other. Now, if you're a Persona fan, the first thing you've probably already noticed is that the art for this game is done by Shigenori Soejima, and this was the first game where he was the lead character designer and art director, almost two years before the release of Persona 3, and I must say, it looks very cool. I especially like the designs of the enemies, but I'll get more into that later. So, Stella Deus takes place in a fictional world called Solemn, and it's on the verge of destruction because it's being swallowed by something called Miasma. To make matters worse, some guy named Dignus is going around with his army terrorizing what's left because he thinks that people who don't have the will to fight don't deserve to live, while at the same time an alchemist named Visor is trying to gather energy from monsters creatively named Spirits because he thinks that they're the key to saving the world. You play as a guy named Sparrow, a friend of Visor who is going around gathering spirits for him, but he soon realizes that hunting down the spirits is only making the growth of the miasma faster, and the real key to saving the world is to open the Gate of Eternity, which he and his friends set out to do. The gameplay of Stella Deus is a turn-based strategy RPG on a grid, but it does things a little differently. Rather than giving you a certain amount of movements and actions, everything is instead paid for using the AP meter. This includes everything from movement to attacks to item usage, and you get a set amount of it each turn. If you move the furthest you're allowed to, you won't have enough AP left to do anything else, but on the plus side, if the enemy is right in front of you, you can just stand there and do multiple attacks. Or you can mix and match, and the more AP you have left at the end of your turn, the sooner you get to move again. Also, if you're close enough to another character with enough AP, you could do a powerful combo attack, which is a great way to deal damage to bosses. It's up to you to find the right use of your AP points to make it through each and every battle, and it's very strategic and a lot of fun. And outside of battle, you can customize your units by teaching them new skills, increasing their stats, and upgrading their classes when the right conditions are met. You also have things like a shop where you can buy new equipment, a guild where you can accept quests, recruit new allies, and fuse items together for more powerful items, and a catacomb where you can grind. Something you'll probably be doing quite a lot of because this game can be quite challenging, especially early on. Battles may not seem so bad when you start them, but by the time you get to the boss, you'll be lucky to have a sufficient amount of resources. And if you don't, well, you might as well just reset the game. It can be frustrating, but it's also all the more rewarding when you make it through a mission. One thing I both love and hate about this game is the lack of a tutorial. The tutorial is pretty much non-existent, and this game throws you right into the meat of its gameplay with little to no explanation. Pretty much every mechanic I've talked about in this video is not explained to you by the game. You do have a tutorial that you can access through the overworld menu, but there is nothing in the game that teaches you the mechanics as you play, and for a game like this, that really would have helped. I strongly recommend using a guide your first time playing, at least for the first couple of hours. Graphically, it isn't amazing, I mean, it's a PS2 game where the characters are represented by sprites rather than 3D models. 
You can tell this was a budget game, but the sprites and animations all look very good. And the soundtrack is this orchestral style that, well, isn't as good as Stella Glow, but it does its job. And like I said earlier, the character designs are really cool. Apparently, Soejima had complete creative freedom when working on this game, and I think that explains a lot of the weird designs, especially with the armored enemies. I really don't know how to describe the style. It's almost alien-like. It kind of makes me wonder what Persona 3, 4, and 5 would have looked like had he been given complete creative freedom for those games, too. The thing about the presentation that will probably stand out to most people, though, is that both the dialogue and voice acting are horrendous. I mean... It's either a case where they're trying way too hard or not trying at all, and the writing doesn't do much to help either. It's bad, and unlike other games I've covered with bad voice acting, it lacks the self-awareness, but it's still hilarious, and I think this alone makes it worth playing with the voices on. It makes a so-so story all the more memorable. Overall, Stella Deus is a great strategy RPG with some unique mechanics and is definitely a fun experience, and I think Soejima's artwork alone makes it worth playing. Unfortunately, like a lot of games since, well, you know what happened, this game used to be cheap physically, but not so much anymore. However, this game did get a digital re-release on the PS3 store, which, unlike a certain other digital store, is still up and has no plans to be taken down anytime soon. So, if you still have your PS3 laying around, definitely give this game a shot. This next game is part of a long-running series of games that you may be familiar with without even knowing it. This game is Shirin the Wanderer, developed by Chunsoft for the Wii and released in 2008 in Japan and 2010 in North America. Now, when most people hear the name Mystery Dungeon, they probably think of the Pokemon Mystery Dungeon series, because that's how me and many other Pokemon fans in the 2000s were introduced to the roguelike genre. But in reality, the Mystery Dungeon series goes back much further, except most of these games never made it outside Japan, and even though Sheeran the Wanderer doesn't have the title Mystery Dungeon in it, it's a Mystery Dungeon game in every aspect except the title. You play as, well, Sheeran, who, you know, wanders across feudal Japan with his sensei and a giant talking ferret named Kopa. Thankfully, the stories for these games are pretty standalone, and the story for this one is that Sheeran and Sensei go on a quest to save some girl who has been allegedly kidnapped by bandits, but then get dragged into a quest to prove that Sheeran is some kind of guest from an ancient prophecy, and it only gets weirder from there. It's not the most engaging story, but it never gets too much in your face, and honestly, I was interested in it just because of the feudal Japanese setting and mythology. Now, the gameplay pretty much speaks for itself. If you played any of the other Mystery Dungeon games, including Pokemon, you'll probably already be familiar with this game. You go through a series of dungeons with randomly generated floors, with randomly generated items placed on the ground, with randomly generated traps scattered about, fight randomly placed enemies, you get the idea. There's a lot of RNG involved, but that's what I like about these kind of games. You never know what's going to happen, and it's going to be a different experience each time you play. It may seem easy, and for the most part it is, but you have to worry about more than just your health meter. You also have to make sure that you don't black out from starvation and decide which items to keep and throw away when your inventory gets full. You also have to make sure to do a sufficient amount of grinding in each dungeon because oftentimes the floor exit will spawn next to the entrance and it can be tempting to want to just skip the floor entirely when this happens. Boss battles could be especially unpredictable and keep in mind that when you die, you lose all your stuff. So if you get a rare item and die next to the boss at the end, it's gone and that can make for a very tense experience. Well, if you're playing on normal anyway. On easy mode, you don't, but where's the fun in that? Oh, and I also forgot to mention that if your ally dies, it's also game over. So, yeah, you gotta worry about him too. The thing about these mystery dungeon games is that on a surface level, they may seem extremely simplistic. I mean, combat pretty much boils down to you just equipping your best weapon and hitting the enemies until they go down. But when you factor in the randomness of the dungeons and the unpredictability of the bosses... All things considered, there is actually a lot of depth to them, and that's no different with Sheeran the Wanderer. The art style, character design, graphics, and music are all really good. During the menu screens, you'll see some beautiful artwork that combines modern art with traditional Japanese-style art, along with some great music. This game has gone up quite a bit in price over the past couple years, and sadly it can't be digitally downloaded, but compared to a lot of other Atlas games, this is actually on the cheaper side, as painful as it is for me to say that. Since the release of this game, we've gotten another Sheeran game, The Tower of Fortune and The Dice of Fate, but there's also Atlas's very own Etrian Mystery Dungeon, Final Fantasy Chocobo's Dungeon, and of course, the extremely awesome Pokemon Mystery Dungeon series. It's hard for me to recommend Sheeran the Wanderer for its price, 
but if you see this game for, say, $40 or less, I suggest picking it up. There is a lot to love about Sheeran the Wanderer for the Wii. This next and final one I suppose isn't that obscure, but as far as games from this developer go, I haven't seen a lot of discussion about this one, at least not recently. Most of the attention for games from this developer seem to go mostly toward either Dragon's Crown or 13 Sentinels. The game I'm talking about is Vanillaware's Odin Sphere, released in 2007 for the PS2, and later remastered and re-released in 2016 for PS3, PS4, and PS Vita, and that is the version that I am playing. Odin Sphere, like most of Vanillaware's other games, is a 2D side-scrolling action RPG that plays a lot like a beat-em-up. You have normal attacks, aerial attacks, slide attacks, dash attacks, pretty much anything you can think of that you'd be able to do with whatever weapon you're holding, you can do. And once you find the right combos, it is a lot of fun launching your enemies into the air and juggling them around like hot potatoes. On top of that, you have a variety of special moves that you can either activate from the command menu or hotkey them to the circle button. And these are going to be especially useful for fighting bosses, and overall, this is just a very action-packed game. This game isn't even all that hardware intensive, but there were a few times there was so much going on I experienced lag in the PS4 version. Yeah. Combat aside, this game has sort of a pseudo-Metroidvania style. Battles take place on these 2D planes with different doors that lead you to different places on the map, which you can look at by pressing R3. Most of these areas just have you fight a single wave of enemies or bosses, but every now and then you'll encounter areas without enemies and will have either treasure, merchants, or a restaurant. This is a good opportunity to level up, and this game has a very unconventional way of doing that. As you defeat enemies, you'll get things called Fozons, and the way you level up is by planting seeds and using Fozons to make the seeds grow, and then eating the fruit to gain experience points. There are other ways to gain EXP too, like eating at restaurants, but most of your leveling is going to be done by eating fruit. The whole process can be annoying, but you can use your Fozons to upgrade your skills as well, and it allows you to level up at your own leisure. If you're overleveled, feel like your skills could use some upgrading, then you can use your Fozons to power up your skills instead. In addition to this, there's also a crafting system, where you can combine items to strengthen them or create new ones. It's not a super in-depth crafting system, but you're probably going to be using it more than you think because of how limited your inventory space is. So on top of all these other things, you also have to carefully decide which items are the most important. But, like most of Vanillaware's games, the real beauty lies within the presentation. Much like the aforementioned Stella Glow, Odin Sphere has an abstract art style that makes it feel like a storybook, but I actually think Odin Sphere does it even better. The art is done by George Kamitani, and out of all the Vanillaware games I've played, I actually think this is his best work, hands down. If the title didn't make it obvious, this game takes a lot of inspiration from Norse mythology, but also takes inspiration from the works of William Shakespeare and several European folklores. The story starts with you taking on the role of Gwendolyn, a Valkyrie who is the daughter of Odin, the demon lord. He's at war with the Kingdom of the Fairies, and he's doing it over a super weapon called the Cauldron. At least that's the synopsis for the first character story early on. There are several twists and turns throughout, and it really will have you on the edge of your seat wanting to find out what will happen next, and later on you'll unlock even more characters to play as. All these stories are intertwined, although what's really going on is that a girl named Alice is reading these stories in her attic, and this is how the game's story is told, which I think only further adds to the game's storybook aesthetic. On top of that, the dialogue is written in this old English style, which fits perfectly, and the voice actors do a superb job. Atlas USA could not have done a better job with this game's localization. Overall, the weakest aspect of this game is the soundtrack. That's not to say it's not good, because it is, but it doesn't really have any soundtracks that stand out. They're just kind of... there. My only other major complaint is that, despite this game being a lot of fun, it can start to feel monotonous after a while, and that's kind of how a lot of these beat-em-up games are. For that reason, I recommend playing it in short bursts. But, whatever the case, Odin Sphere is a phenomenal game that is a must-play, especially if you're a fan of Vanillaware's other games, like 13 Sentinels and Dragon's Crown. And it's even easier to recommend, because this game isn't even that old. I recommend the PS4 version, since it runs the best and is on the most accessible platform, but whichever version you decide to go with, you cannot go wrong with Odin Sphere. And that is going to be it for this video. I hope y'all enjoyed, and be sure to tell me what you think. I know many of you are still hoping for part 2 of Persona 5 Velvetless. I wanted to get a video out before Anime Expo, but I just didn't have time since that video is going to be very long and there was all the news we got last week. 
but I promise that is going to be my next video after this one. As always, be sure to rate, comment, and subscribe if you want to support me financially. Consider leaving a Ko-Fi donation. Be sure to check out my other links in the description. And until the next video, I will see you guys later.